You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Y'all, we are in Joshua chapter 17. I'm going to hang out verses 12 through 18. And, and, and I kind of grappled a little bit with how I wanted to kind of wrap my arms around this text. And we're still in the series, the section of this is the, the Joshua series, the success series, which is on the book of Joshua. And we're now arriving at that portion where we see the allotments to the various tribes and them receiving their inheritance. And so in Joshua chapter 17, we start to see some additional information um, in terms of what is received by Manasseh and Ephraim, what we see in the various tribes. But there's something that has jumped out for me in this chapter that I want to teach about. And what I want to really focus on today is how, and maybe it's just, just for James Gallier, but how sometimes in life I am my own worst enemy. And, and what I want to teach about today is refusing to be my own worst enemy. Come on, everybody say, I refuse to be my own worst enemy. I, I want to, because I've learned, y'all, if some, I've had days, y'all don't, hope you won't be too offended by my, my transparency and honesty, but I've had days that if Satan totally left me alone, I still was going to have a bad day. <laughs> because... <laughs> Because I was still with me. I was still grappling with my stuff. And so I want to figure out how not to do that. And I think Joshua chapter 17 gives us great insight on that. So I want to to read beginning at verse 12. I'll read down to the end of the chapter. And then let's say a few things that I hope will connect with us. Joshua chapter 17, beginning at verse 12. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities... Now, let me, even before I read, I'm sorry. Understand where this is happening. This is in the promised land. This is at my moment of inheritance. And yet, I still can't fully embrace what God is doing. I'm going to talk about that in my first introduction point. And so, the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities But the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, everybody say, I'm growing strong. Uh, Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given me but one lot? and one portion as an inheritance, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me. Joshua said to them, if you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Beth Shean and its villages, and those in the valley of Jezreel. And then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess to it its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. Amen. So let's unpack this for a moment. Let's, let, me, let me give you two thoughts to introduce the subject matter. 
The first thought that I want us to grab a hold of and grapple with for a moment is that we should all make this declaration, and that is, I want to move beyond the tragedy of partial victory. I want to move beyond the tragedy of partial victory. What you see with Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh, the tribes, as they now occupy the inheritance of the promised land, over and over again, we see here in Joshua chapter 17, where first of all, they're not driving out the Canaanites, and second of all, the territory that God has allotted for them, they're not fully enjoying because it is filled with trees. It has been covered. And, and, and let me tell you one of the tragedies of the Christian life. One of the cra- tragedies of the Christian life is to finally get where God wants you and not being able to enjoy it. You, you, spent, you spent all of those years to choose that career only to hate what you do. All of those years, you said you wanted to be married, now you are, and you don't never want to come home. You, you said you wanted to be a parent, a mama, a daddy, and now the kids have to beg you for time. What, what, what a tragedy to finally get saved, join a church, and then don't want to come because I don't like the people in it. What, we have to guard ourselves from the tragedy of a partial victory. Let me say how this looks. This is the second introductory statement, and then I'm going to give you about five things we can do to not be our own worst enemy. God wants us, and he's showing us this in Joshua 17, to move beyond circumstantial to consistent victory. If you start to, if you notice what we read, what we see here, is that God has placed them in the promised land, and now here they are, not able to enjoy the inheritance, and they have a moment of circumstantial victory. I'm, and let me tell you what it looks like in the Christian life. It looks like being on an emotional, theological roller coaster. I mean, what a miserable existence where I'm saved, I'm, God loves me, I love God, I'm right where God wants me to be, and I don't know when I get up in the morning if I'm going to have joy or not. I'm gonna know if, I don't know if when I get up in the morning there's going to be peace in my life or not. And God is trying to move us from a place where my occupying in this place of victory is not some circumstantial. In other words, it's not dependent on the stuff that's going on around me. I shouldn't worry about Canaanites and chariots of iron, and I don't need to worry about. Notice what's happening. They are so preoccupied with Canaanites, trees, and iron that they can't even enjoy the inheritance. Now, you may say, that's ridiculous. What in the world? Let me tell you, we are the exact same way. Let one thing happen that I didn't expect. Let there be one enemy surface that I think was going to surface. Let there be one obstacle I wasn't expecting the obstacle to have. And then all of a sudden, instead of me waking up with great joy and excited about the day that God has given me, I'm so preoccupied with the iron against me and the Canaanites against me and the trees I have to cut down. Never mind the fact. Let me help you understand something. God, if this is the land you gave me, I'm not going to let a tree keep me from enjoying it. And so we have to understand, y'all, that, and let me just say this, let me just say this, because I just want this thing to minister to us. I think if we learn to appreciate small things, then I don't live so dependent on big things. I think too many times as believers, man, I need the big wow. How about I'm in the promised land? Let me, can I tell you what it looks like in 2020? If you finally been blessed with the house, who need furniture right now? I mean, it, 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 if God finally said have the house, sleep on the floor. Can, can I tell you what many of us do? We can't even, and whoever I'm talking to, don't, don't, don't be offended. I'm just how the Holy Ghost is just talking to me. You can't even enjoy the house because you got to have more than the house. 
So then you go in debt putting furniture in the house, and then you can't even enjoy the bed because you really can't afford the note to buy the bed when you could have just slept on the floor and thank God for what he gave you. Thank God for a roof over my head. Thank God. And so they can't enjoy all that God has blessed them with because, because they're focusing on. Notice what he said. And um, we're too big to have this little land. He's like, um, you, you see them trees right there? You cut all the trees down you want, you have all the land you want. And part of the reason why you're feeling so tight is because we told you to wipe out the Canaanites. Now, you feel like your space is small because they're occupying your territory. And part of the way we expand our horizon, let me tell you, it's almost like being miserable at home and not wanting to come home. Until you deal with the enemy that's keeping you from home, you'll always be looking for a different territory when the blessing is to take care of the enemy I need to take care of that's destroying my joy inside the territory that God has given me. So here they are, their own worst enemy. And so let me say some things that they teach us how to combat that. Here's the first thing I want us to, to jot down and to, and to focus on for a minute. Number one, we need to learn to consider our potential. Everybody say, I have great potential. I, I want you to get that in your spirit. Understand, first of all, what my potential is. In chapter 17, verse 12, yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. And now when the people of Israel grew strong, finally they saw, so understand something, they are not able to take possession because the Canaanites persisted. Please get this. Boy, this is such a good word. Verse 13, when they grew strong which means they always had in them what was necessary that the enemy would not persist. And I think sometimes we don't recognize, as a matter of fact, if they had enough power, God, this is such a good word, to cause them to become forced labor and to be slaves, then they had enough power to kill them. And when you look at it, they did not recognize their own potential. We are allowing things to hold us hostage and things to keep us from enjoying the sweet spot that God has given us because we don't recognize I am greater than this. And I want you to get that in your spirit. As believers, I do not need to settle for a promised land that has Canaanites dwelling in it. I've got to get myself to a place. Everybody say, I'm getting stronger. I want you to get this. When you have something working against you, you already have the potential to conquer it. You have the potential to stop smoking. You have the potential to not cheat on your spouse. You have the potential to absorb the word. You have the potential to be everything God has called us to be. But we've got to recognize our own potential. And at some point, I've got to come to myself. And finally, it says in verse number 13, when they grew strong, I'm wondering, can you say that? How many of us have been saved for years and yet haven't grown strong enough to enslave the Canaanites? And they grew strong. I'm going to keep saying it because I want it in our spirit. And they grew strong. You are stronger than that drink you can't put down. And I want you to hear me. I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. I'm speaking your strength to you. You are stronger than that. You don't have to sleep with every man that comes along. You're stronger than that. You don't have to settle for some bad relationship that's not what God wants. We are stronger than that. And so let me say a few things about this. Considering my potential, first of all, is a matter of understanding that I can't compromise my commitment. I can't compromise my commitment. Here they are, occupying the land, and yet 
not recognizing what God has fully committed them to. I have some questions and reflection that's going to tie into this at the end of the Bible study. And so we have to, if we're going to grow strong and recognize our potential, we have to not compromise the commitment. Let me tell you the key to maximizing potential. The key to maximizing potential is work and discipline. Most folk have great potential, but they lazy. Teach Pastor Gail. They, they have great. I'm so, it's right there in the text. You have all this land, but you won't go ch- cut down no trees. I've given it to you, but what do you want me to do? Cut the tree down for you too? And so we have to recognize what our commitment is and not compromise our commitment to expend our energy on what God is calling us to. But the second part of recognizing my potential is that I need to address the sin of living beneath my potential. This is going to be a a rough word for somebody, but I hope you get it. Just because I'm in the promised land does not mean I'm living up to my personal potential. And this is one of the things that we have to grab a hold as church folk, as believers. First of all, we have to stop judging people based upon the standard of other people. This is very important because there might be some student that literally their potential is a B, is a B. And, and they might be at that potential. And here's another student with Bs, but they have A potential. And what we do is we tend to celebrate the people that are at a certain standard, not recognizing, you know what? I'm not celebrating where you are because here's the truth of the matter. You're better than that. And we get all caught. This is why we should never judge ourselves against other people. Because I can judge myself against you, and the reality of it is you could be living up to your full potential. And I could still be living at my bare bone minimal potential. And when you look at the children of Israel, when you look at the tribes of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim, they're in the promised land. They're occupying the promised land. But they have potential to occupy that promised land without the Canaanites, to clear that land. And we have, this is the sin we don't talk about. The sin of living beneath my potential. Some of us are so good with being where we are that we're not confessing that, God, I'm supposed to be past this. It's like, oh, man. I'm I'm, I'm so, I feel so good about me that, that I didn't cuss you out that I'm not even owning the fact that I should already be past you being able to rattle me. And so let's keep, let's hang in there for a moment because I want you to see all of this. So the first issue is potential. But the second issue, you're going to be surprised, is I need to confess my pride. Because if you look at verse 14, then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua Why have you given me but one lot and one portion? I'm a numerous people. Since all along, the Lord has blessed me. How dare me? How dare we? How dare you say to God, I deserve more? Can we be honest? The truth of the matter, God, is I don't even deserve the lot that you gave me. And we have to learn that, God, if you don't... So this is the juxtaposition. Because in one regard, I've got to recognize my potential. But in another regard, I can't be so prideful. Let me help you understand something. It is not in our boasting, but it is in our believing that gives us victory. See, they're not getting the victory because of their boasting. We are a great people, and we did this with God. We did. That's not where we get victory. Where I get victory and where I gain the new territory is not what I'm boasting about with me, but what I'm believing about with God. So it's not I deserve more. Oh, please get this. It's not that I deserve more. That's boasting about me. It's you're more generous than this. Y'all missed it. It's not James Gallier should get more. 
Because that's a boasting of James Gallier. It's I'm believing something about God. God, I know you better than this. I know you're more generous than this. I know you're more kind than this. So it's not that I'm getting more territory and I'm gaining more because I'm boasting on me. It's because I'm believing on God. And too many times we feel like it's because I prayed so good and I got such a prayer life and I put my hands on you and I know how to get a prayer through. God don't answer prayer because you know how to pray. He answers prayer because he's a prayer answering God. And it's a difference because I know I've seen God move on people that don't even have good subject verb agreement. They don't even have good theology. They don't even know how to get the word out right. And God blesses, not because they pray so good, but because he's so good. And we got to recognize, y'all, that I've got to confess my pride. And some of us really believe he going to do it because you prayed. Well, excuse me. He going he gonna to save because I preached. He going to change, he going to save your marriage because I taught. No, that's boasting on us. We need to confess that pride. God don't need nobody with a master's in divinity or a master's in th sacred theology to fix your marriage. God is a marriage fixer and he can take a grandmama with a fourth grade education and speak a word and change your life. And I'm not being anti-education and anti-preparation. What I'm saying is none of that moves God. And here they are. We are great people. We should have more, more of a portion. I'm a numerous people. God been blessing me. And Joshua's response, I love, he said, you know what then? If you deserve it because you're so good, then you go get it. You go get it. You, since, since it's all about you, and it's all about what you're supposed to have, go ahead. You go ahead and get it. We have to learn to confess our pride. This is why we should be, we should celebrate every church in our community. I mean, every church that's open in Jesus' name. We, we have to celebrate every church because sometimes God is not going to use a guy that's exegeting the text to get to that person and change their life. Sometimes he's going to use the bivocational pastor with 10 members. Y'all not being honest in here. Sometimes he's going to use the parachurch ministry in the community. So it's, it's not about our pride. It's not about our boasting. It is about who God is in his blessing that moves us forward. And sometimes we're our worst enemy because we feel like, well, God's going to do it. The church going to be fine because I teach good. Let me tell you something. It's a whole bunch of closed churches with pastors who taught good. We, we have to own this thing. It is not, I know I'm taking a long time, but I want this thing to get in our spirit. You know, God, he, you, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a good wife. I deserve better than this. Oh, so you, your marriage is about you boasting on how good a spouse you are. No, God is not going to make your marriage amazing because you're such a good spouse. He's going to make your marriage amazing because he instituted marriage. So we got to stop boasting. Does that make sense? Are y'all hearing me? And, 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 so, and so the second thing is I need to confess. So they confess their pride. So they're not their own. We got to confess our pride so we're not our own worst enemy. Number three. Number three, um, let me just say this, y'all. <laughs> Pride shows up in theology and in orthodoxy. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Pride shows up in us making, and this is one of my pet peeves about us preachers. So I might as well go ahead and deal with it. The inerrancy of Scripture, the Bible is right, even if I don't get it right. The exclusivity of Jesus Christ, the only way I can get saved is by Jesus. And salvation by grace alone, I can't work my way in. After them three, 
Whatever you believe, if, <laughs> how much trouble do I want to get myself in? Okay. If you want to be an apostle, that's your business. If I want to, I told you I was going to get myself in trouble. You know, if somebody else want to license women to preach, that's their business. If somebody else want, because we cannot make a God out of our interpretation. And there is so much pride attached to our interpretation of the scriptures. And this is our problem. Can I say something I hope we can receive? This is why we got to be very careful about judging how to understand how you can be a Christian and vote for Trump. Y'all didn't expect me to go there, did you? I don't know how you can be a Christian and judge me for how I see my Christianity. Uh-oh. I know, see, I know, y'all don't want to be, if I had said it the other way, folk would have been, I know that's right, I know that's right. And how many times are we saying, how can you be a Christian voting for somebody that's, that's creating division and hatred? And then somebody else saying, how can you be a Christian voting for somebody that kills babies? And we got all of this theological pride. And where pride shows up in the church is in theology and then in orthodoxy. Orthodoxy being the practice of my theology, being the practice of my doctrine how we worship, how we sing, how we vote, how we do various things that are tied to what I say I believe. And we as believers have got to realize this is good for all churches. You know, if someone came up and prayed from their heart, those of us who believe you should write a prayer out first should not be judging that. And someone who came up to pray wrote their prayer out, and they started reading their prayer, we should not be judging it as if it's less anointed. I need to confess my sin. I'm busy judging you, and I've got to recognize none of this is about us. It's about who God is. All right, let me move on. Where am I at? Number three. Number three... I need to then conquer my passiveness. I need to conquer my passiveness. Verse number 15 is the response. And Joshua said to them, if you are numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. Let's talk about a little bit of this. Here's the first issue about addressing my passiveness. Number one, satisfaction sabotages victory. I can never become so satisfied with where God has me that I don't pursue more that I become so passive, because let me tell you what happens. Getting into the promised land sometimes is not as difficult a fight as advancing in the promised land. Okay, that, y'all missed it. I'm going to be a better teacher so you can get it. Walking down the aisle of the church, clicking on a radio button online saying, I want to be saved. That's entry into the promised land. That's the easy part. The hard part is feeling like I've arrived, feeling like I've made it. And then now, it's not hard to say I want to be saved. Can I tell you what's hard? Turning my plate down for a week. What's hard is getting up an hour earlier every day to have some talk time with God. It is not the initial step. It is where I have to go deep. And we as believers have to stop being satisfied with I'm saved and I'm not going to hell and I'm going to heaven. And then meanwhile, I'm stuck in hell on earth. And so their, their satisfaction is sabotaging their victory. 
Because here they are, we made it into the promised land, and it's never dawning on us that on the other side of them trees is our stuff too. But I'm so used to walking in it. And let me tell you something. Let me say something that it might be the best point in the Bible study. And this has been the Lord has really convicted me. Before I give it to you, let me give it to you, and then I'm, I'm going to confess. Here's the point. If there was ever a time that I was once closer to God than I am now, then I am backslidden. I'm going to make a confession. I have pastored Word Tabernacle and been backslidden. Not because I was doing some heinous, horrible, awful sin. That's what some of y'all were thinking I was talking about. Let me tell you why. Because I was letting the busyness of church affect my devotion life. I was letting the activity of what it meant to be a pastor and to author programs and to build programs and to lead staff and to direct people hinder how close I was to God. And let me tell you what we have to grab a hold of that we don't want to be honest about. It's a whole bunch of us that get on prayer calls together and a bunch of us that do small groups together and a bunch of us that do various activities together. And the truth of the matter is I'm not as close to God now as I was a year ago. And this is what we have to recognize that I can become so passive I can become so satisfied. At least I'm saved. At least I'm getting my inheritance. At least I'm in the promised land. You know, I'm not trying to harp this point, but this is real talk. If If you always were at Bible study before COVID, and now you might get on, you might not, you're in a backslidden position. If you never miss church and now you might get on. Some of you, y'all be so offended, but I don't care. You know I don't care. You know I love y'all too much to care whether y'all mad at me. If you used to care so much about God that you would get up an hour and a half before church, shower, dress, be your best view person, be your best self. Take 30 minutes to get in the room because God's... Being with him meant that much to you to give him that advanced time to put myself together. I want to get in your presence and be good, God. And then COVID hit. And now I'm having church laying in bed. I'm eating eggs while I'm worshiping. You are backslidden. I guess I don't get a whole lot of love for teaching this kind of stuff, but... Because if I am not as close to God now as I once was, I am in a backslidden position. Because I've not conquered my passiveness. I'm so satisfied that at least I'm in church, Pastor. I know I'm I'm in bed, but I'm in church. No, but no, no. He's saying, don't be so caught up in the fact that you're in the promised land I want you to get this, that you stop cutting down trees. So let me go ahead and teach it. It's my fourth point. So then what I need to do is I need to confront my problems. I got to confront my problems. And, 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 so, and so let me say a few things about it. I got I to press. I got to press. And so, in verse number 16, the first thing that we see here is understanding that sin suppresses victory. The sin is them not being willing, A, to work like God has called them to work, and then not understanding that the Canaanites should not be dwelling in that land to begin with. And so, we have to recognize that whenever I sin, I suppress the victory that God has given me in my life. What does that look like, Pastor? The first thing that looks like is I can't compromise with the culture. Y'all, 
I'm, I'm only going to get this far. I, I don't know that I can get through this. I, I, I can't compromise with the culture. Notice what happens. He says in verse number 16, the people of Joseph said the hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell on the plain have chariots of iron and, 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 they're, they're, um, and, and it's villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. And we've already seen what they have said is we are not going to fight with the culture. They have chariots. They have iron. We're going to figure out a way to all live together. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes the church is making. That we have to recognize I'm not trying to live with Canaanites. And so what is this issue about compromising with the culture? What is it that we see? You know what? I'm going to do a whole Bible study next week on it. I'm not even going to get into it. I'm going to get through this note sheet and try to deal with this next week. But can I, let me just say this. Let me give you an example of how we compromise with the culture as Christians. One of the ways we compromise with the culture as Christians in 2020, especially in this volatile time we're living in, is making an idol out of America. Can I tell you about the Jesus I serve? I'm not scared to say what I'm about to say. The Jesus I serve does not need to be wrapped in a flag to be God. The Jesus I serve does not need to be wrapped in nationalism. He doesn't need star-spangled hyperbole. The Jesus I serve was a homeless, leper-touching, wound-mending, foot-washing, street preacher that didn't need none of that stuff to be God. He already was God. He will always be God, and he will be king of kings and lord of lords without a flag on him. And we have to stop compromising with the culture and acting like Jesus needs a flag to be God. I don't know about y'all, my Jesus is bigger than that. My Jesus is bigger than that. I don't need to marry Jesus in politics. Some of y'all missed that point. Can I remind y'all something? Jesus already has a bride. He, three institutions ordained by God church, government, family. He's like, well, I need a bride. I'm picking the church. I don't need to compromise with the culture. I don't have to do that. But I also don't have to cower before the culture. Many people, you know, I get a lot of hate emails these days. And the reason I get hate emails these days is because people are not accustomed to us as believers not being afraid of the culture. And God has not called us to be silent. We have to have the enough, enough kind of an apologetic that we know how to defend our faith and our belief. And then here's, I think, the last thing. I need to control my priorities. This is life-changing what I'm about to say. I'm going to rush through this. Look at verse 17 and 18. Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours, for though it is a forest. Everybody say a forest. I want you to get this. Though it is a forest, you shall clear it. God, I'm about to run around this room. Do you know how many times we pray for a forest? I mean, we pray for land. I want you to get this. How many times we're praying? I want you to see this. We're praying for land. God shows us trees, and it never dawns on us. All I need to do is clear it to get my prayer answered. So let me say a few things. Here's the first thing. And this is going to take a lot of thinking, y'all, to stick with me. 
the next opportunity, everybody say the next opportunity, that the next opportunity is waiting on my assimilation of the last opportunity. <laughs> He's saying, why in the world are you asking for land when you have land with trees on it? What you're asking for, you will receive if you fully take advantage of what I've already given you. When I say assimilate, I'm talking about absorbing. I'm talking about capitalizing on it. I'm talking about digesting it. I'm talking about fully taking it in. We don't recognize, man, that sometimes God has already given us what he promised, but it just comes in a package we weren't expecting. And we've got to be able to embrace this opportunity by saying, God, everything you have given me. I don't have time to tell my testimony over and over again. I, one of these days I'll tell it again. Let me give you this next one. Oh, this is so good. I need two or three extra minutes. I need to clear out the simple things that clutter my life. <laughs> he said, Here's the thousand dollar question. The only reason they can't see the land is because it's cluttered with trees. How many of us have already been given the land, but you can't see it because you have not gotten rid of the clutter? Man, this thing, everybody say declutter my life. I, I'm sometimes my biggest enemy because I have so much clutter. I need to learn how to reduce my commitments. I don't have any, no love in here. Declutter. I need, can I tell you something that some of us have too many of them, too much, too much of? Friendships. And I've allowed people that are now toxic and draining my energy to clutter my land. <laughs> can I throw this in for free? I'm meddling. Do you have that junk drawer in your kitchen? <laughs> Lord, forgive us. Because I, I want you to hear what you just said. Now watch this. What did you just say? It's a... God saying, you don't even lack the discipline. You lack the discipline to even get rid of junk. How can I give you treasure when you want to embrace junk? I won't even clean out the junk drawer. Oh, boy. Everybody say declutter, declutter. I... Now, watch this. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Sometimes the enemy is not the sinful, but the simple. He's not saying your problem is your sin life. He's saying you have a simple problem of decluttering. Just cut down the trees. Here you are. I got to pray more. No, you need, to, you need to clear out the junk drawer. I, I need to have a better devotion life. It's not the sinful stuff. It's the simple stuff. And then finally, remove the sinful things that corrupt my life. After I remove the simple things that clutter my life, I need to remove the sinful things that corrupt my life. Have you noticed, y'all, is it just me? It seemed like, it seemed like food doesn't last as long as it used to. I, and I'm amazed by how often we have to, from time to time, throw out, you know, some bread that we didn't eat the whole loaf, and then we look up, and then it, there's some mold on a piece of bread. I'm going somewhere. And when I grab that roll, I'm about to make a sandwich, and I see it's five pieces of bread left, and I see the very first piece molded, but then I'm kind of looking and like them other four kind of look all right, but I'm not willing to take the chance. I want, I'm going somewhere, y'all. Mold spreads. Leaven spreads. It, it ruins the whole lump. I'm, I'm going somewhere. 
we all have some kind of sin that we have convinced ourselves is compartmentalized. God, I'm good in everything else. It's just this one thing I'm struggling with. I want you to get the image of that loaf of bread. It doesn't work that way. If I'm sinful in one area of my life, it spreads and touches all of my life. And so I have to be able to deal with the sin that is corrupting my life because I'm my worst enemy. And so I hope this is helpful, y'all. Let me give you the reflection questions. If you're in a small group, if you're in a church at study group, I hope you have a group that you're studying with. This can be a way to kind of start your Zoom call or maybe a way to, you know, reflect throughout the week. And, and it'll be a, a de personal devotion for all of us. Number one, what outward circumstances or circumstance have I allowed to affect my inward peace and joy? And why? I mean, y'all going to be very offended by, with me when I say this, and I mean it in love. Why are you so depressed because of COVID? I mean, okay, you can't go out. And is God not still good? Is he still not your joy and your peace? Why am I allowing circumstance to affect me inwardly? Second question. Am I living up to my full potential? In what area of my life can it be said I'm better than this? Maybe how I manage my money, the time I spend with my family. How can I say I'm better than this? What area of my life can I say, you know what, I'm better than this? And then here's the last question. Because they would not drive out the Canaanites. They said, you know what, we kind of like these guys. We're going to let them become slaves, hang out with us. Here's my last question. What Canaanites am I fond of? Who do I let gossip in my ear because they're funny? Long time ago, I'll close on this. I used to have hair, and um, I was one of them. I'm, I was one of them straight Barbara every Saturday morning dudes. Every Saturday morning, and um, and I was one of them guys. You know, you get a good barber, good hairdresser, you drive, you do what you gotta do. And so I had to go way on the other side. I Man, I get up early in the morning, go way on the other side. Me and Kyle. And then eventually it was Matthew. Three of us go to the barbershop Saturday morning, and the boy could cut. God, he could cut. But he was a heathen. <laughs> and they be in the back, man. They, they selling 40s in the back and smoking weed. And <sighs> but I wouldn't go anywhere else to get my hair cut because I was fond of that Canaanite. Meanwhile, it was exposing my sons. And eventually, I had to make up in my mind and not be my own worst enemy. And how many of you, and go to another barber, my hair wasn't as fly, fly. My line wasn't like I was used to. My fade wasn't like I wanted. But at least I didn't have the Canaanite to deal with anymore. Can I give you something to shout about? Probably... 8, 10, 12 months after I left that barber, on a Saturday morning when I normally go, some drug guys went there and shot up the place. It wound up closing forever. And I could have wound up, me and my sons, being shot up because I was fined of a Canaanite. How many times you let somebody do your hair because they're good? but they're Canaanites. I go to your restaurant because that food is slamming, man, but you're Canaanite. And what I want us to grab a hold of is I can't keep being my own worst enemy. I may have to forego some stuff that I'm fond of so that I'm not exposing myself to a people that God doesn't want me around. Say amen if you can. 
Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.